And I just want to encourage you guys that God has made a covenant with us. He will not break his covenant with us. Amen? Amen. You know, we might Amen. deny him, but he won't deny us. Aren't yeah. you glad for that? Right. You know, we yeah. might forsake him, but he won't forsake us. Amen. And I just want to encourage you on that. We're going to go to the book of Psalms 23. You've probably heard this, this psalm so many times, maybe in, in, in movies, at funerals, at weddings, you know, and I mean in bars. <laughs> and so we want to get into this real quickly and just kind of go and, and just start to flow. But I want to just share here, uh, the Bible says here, and it's a very familiar portion of Scripture, but in this Scripture, in this portion, we see the attributes of God. We see His lovely attributes. Amen. The Bible says that the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Aren't you glad that he leads us? That he doesn't, dra that he doesn't drag us? And neither does he kick us. Amen? He leads us. Amen? And the scripture says that he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Everything that we do is for his name's sake. Amen? And then the scripture says also that... Though I walk, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Amen. Yes. No matter what place we're in in life, that God's going to comfort us. Amen. Yes. Though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and I'll never forget this one illustration that was so well put, that you know what, when you walk towards the light, when you walk towards the light, always remember that your shadow is behind you, right? Yeah. But when you walk away from the light, the shadow's in front of you. In other words, is that when you walk towards the light in the valley of the shadow of death, that you know what, your shadow or the darkness is behind you. But when you walk away from the light, you walk right into the darkness. Amen. Amen. And so this is something that we need to realize, that there is no retreat in the kingdom of God. There's no backing Amen. down. It's always onward and advancement. Amen. It's Amen. always onward and upward. Can you say Amen. 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 So the Bible says that your rod and your staff, they comfort me. How can a rod and a stick comfort us? Amen. But it does. Amen. Sometimes we need comfort. Like, no, God's not going to massage you with that thing. Amen. Sometimes he's going to snap it at you. Amen. And sometimes we need that in our lives. Can you say amen? We're going to be talking about that just a little bit more. But the Bible says they comfort me. And then he says these words, which we're going to build the whole sermon on, is that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And, yeah. and you anoint my head with oil, and my cup runs over. I love the way God anoints us, that he is sloppy. Amen? I mean, you know, he doesn't just give us, a, that's enough for you, that's enough. No, no, he just, yeah, you want some more? I mean, he just anoints us and, and lets our cup run over. Amen? This is the goodness of God. God is not stingy like us. Amen? Hello, I got one amen. God is not stingy like us. Amen? We serve a generous God who is looking forward to blessing seeing you and yeah, I. Yeah, yes. yeah. Then the Bible says, surely goodness. This, these are the things that follow you in your life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Yeah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you, Lord, for all that you've done in our lives. And Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you prepare a table, Lord, before our enemies, God. You prepare a table for us. Lord, and we thank you for your, your, your just abundance, Lord, your grace in our lives. Your, Lord God, your pursuit, the Lord God, of our hearts, Lord, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray this morning that you would help me, anoint me to communicate. So Lord God, somewhat of a way of your heart, God, for your people. And Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Now I want to talk about this morning is about coming to the table. Coming to the table and how God it gives us an invitation. The Bible says in John chapter 6, 37, it says, All that the Father has given me, and I, all that the Father has given me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will in no way cast out, or I will in no way drive away. You see, God gives us an invitation. He's a God that wants us to have fellowship with Him. Amen. And the Bible also says in Revelations 22, 17, The Spirit and the Bride say, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who comes say, Come. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. Whoever wishes, let him come and take the free gift of the water of life. The God that we serve is a God that invites us. 
He invites us into fellowship. Unfortunately, there's so many Christians today and maybe the mindsets of the unsaved that feel that God is so far away, that God does, that, that you know, you don't even ask him for those small things or you don't even bother him because, you know, he's busy saving the world. But you've got to understand something. God knows every hair on our head. He knows everything. He knows every pain, every hurt, every distraught. He knows things that cause us to laugh. He knows us, amen. He knows everything about us. And he is a God that desires intimate relationship with his people. So let me just say as a disclaimer, I don't believe in religion. Religion can't help nobody. Amen. I believe in Jesus. Amen. A reality of a relationship with our Heavenly Father. So the great preparation to come was made. A great preparation was made by God the Father for us to have fellowship with a holy God. He made this great preparation. How did he do this? He sent his son to die for us. Jesus, who shed his blood, he made it. So he didn't just call you. He didn't just throw out the invitation, but he says, look, I'm going to prepare a table, and I'm going to make great preparation so that you can come. I'm going to break down walls that have been obstacles in your life. I'm going to break down any barriers that have hindered you from coming, and I'm going to send my son to break that barrier. I mean, how much more can we ask for? For God to have a relationship with us. Right. Amen. Amen. How much more can we ask? And also we understand that no longer that he shall be a distant God. He is not a distant God. He's our father. Amen. Let me make another disclaimer that Islam and Christianity do not serve the same God. They don't serve the same God. They might have Allah and they call Allah, but Allah is not the God that we serve. You go to Israel and you go to the mosque and the first thing that you see, it says Allah has no son. They make it very clear that Allah has no son. And because of that, you see the characteristics of that Islam. It's demanding. It's legalistic. It's, it's, it's control. It's, you know, it's all about, you know, what you got to do and you never measure up. There's no grace in it whatsoever. Yeah. Right. But our God has a son. And because our God has a son, we can go to him, not as some commander or dictator, but we go to him as our father. Amen. Amen. So Amen. Jesus, yes. when he came in on the scene in the, in the Gospels, it was such a surprise to the religious world. All he introduced was his father, my father, my father. He was getting it very clear to them that there's a father in heaven who loves us and wants relationship. Amen. It is so yeah. different when we go to a God than when we go to a father. Amen. Amen. See, Amen. Allah has no son. God has a son. Amen? Amen. And it shows us the difference. He loves us. We can go to God and say, I love you, God, because of an intimate relationship. Not because he didn't call me today to go blow myself up. Amen? He already Amen. Are you, are you with me here? We can go to God and say, oh, God, I love you just because I love you. Not for what you've done or anything, just because I love you. Amen. This is a relationship that Amen. we can have. So Allah has no son, but the God that we serve has. Amen. Amen. That's right. So it's very clear. Can you say amen? amen. Amen. So as we also see that with this relationship that we have with God, it makes it even more interesting that God is interested in fellowshipping with us more than we want to fellowship with him. Maybe this morning you're thinking right now, gosh, I want, I know I need to pray more. I need, I, I need, I need to get, a, get, get along with God more and all that stuff. But you know what? That God is more interested in getting along with you than you are with him. That God pursues us. The Bible says, just on a side note, in Deuteronomy, I think it's 28 too, the, the Bible talks about that the blessings of God will overtake us and overwhelm us. This is the blessing of God that he want, he's chasing after us. You know, when you try to run from God, I don't care how old you are, you try to run from God, you're going to run right in them. He's going to set things up. He's going to put people in your path. I mean, he's going to do everything in his, his power to manipulate, to work, to, to put things in order so that way you come into a crash course with him. Amen. Because he's after us. We call it this way. He's the hound dog of heaven. And he knows how to sniff us out. Amen. He knows how to find us when we're Amen. trying to hide. Because he wants us. And when we get a hold of this, because I've been a Christian for many years, but recently, I, in my life, I got the revelation, simple revelation, Jesus loves me. Amen. I know he loved me, but wait a minute, wait. I know that's a fact. I know it's theologically sound and, and doctrinally right, but wait a minute. He loves me. Amen. 
He loves me while I was yet a sinner. Amen. While I was lost, he still loved me. And, you know, we know that from the mind, but when it enters the heart, it changes everything about you. Amen. Amen. You know that he loves you. And you and you have this relationship, and you walk around saying, "Well, wow, he loves me. I've been preaching this all these years, and I finally got it. He loves me. Amen. Amen. Some of us need that spiritual knock in the head. Come on, Come on. Amen. He loves Amen. us. Yes. Not only that, that we see that God developing a relationship with us as we are in Him. Jesus shed His blood in so many places, and I and as we we think about the path to the cross, so many places that Jesus dropped His blood for us. Now we understand that the blood means power. The blood means life. Yeah. First place that Jesus dropped His blood was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember that? In the pressure places. And that blood that dropped was life. In him was life. It wasn't some red liquid. It was life. And he brought life to those places of our pressure points, to those places of our hard times. He spilled his blood for that. The Bible says also that, that later on that they took him to the whipping pulse. Remember that? They humiliated him. Even in our shame, Jesus spilled his blood on that whipping pulse. So that way we can call life in the times of our shame. Amen. He got those, they got those crown of thorns and put it on his head, which represented the curse and, and re 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 represented mockery. And the blood touched those thorns and brought life, amen, to the curses of our life. Amen. Everywhere that Jesus spilled his blood, if the enemy knew that his blood was going to bring life, if the enemy knew, if, if, the, if the devil knew that the blood of Jesus was going to bring life to all these situations, he would have made sure that he would not have bled anywhere. Amen. But Jesus bled and brought life to you and I. Come on, can you say amen? amen. amen. Even to the... Even on the cross, when they put the, the even the, 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 what do you call it? I'm sorry, the spikes through his hands, the nails through his hands, man-made, man-made things. You know the only man-made things in heaven will be the scars yep. on the hands of Christ. Right. The only man-made things in heaven that we will see, and we'll see those scars. But you know what? Even on man-made things, he brought blood, blessing your creativity, blessing your hands that, that have skill. Amen. You can call on the blood of Jesus. Amen. Say, God, I, I have a project. I'm going to use my hands on this. And Lord, you bless man-made things, Lord. And I know that I can speak the life over this. Can you say amen? amen. Every amen. place where Jesus spilled his blood brought life. Hallelujah. Amen. amen. Oh, I can't. That's a whole other sermon. But here, Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus was in the garden and was offering himself in agony and stress. And Jesus saying these words that if there was any other way, if there was any other program, if there was any other solution than this for me to go to the cross, because Jesus knew what was going to happen. He knew everything that was going to break forth. He knew that that phone was going to ring this morning. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, at this point, was saying, let this cup pass from me. Let this cup pass from me, he says. And being all man, 100% man, and 100% God, as my wife was sharing yesterday, I mean, he was making a decision and saying, you know, not my will, but your will be done. And this brings us to a place that we under, understand that it's that we come to a place in our life where Jesus says, not my will, not my work, but your work be done. Amen. He came to the place, well, if there's no other way, then this is the way, and I will accept it. I will take this cup of suffering. Amen. Amen. And this is something we understand that, that the Bible talks about in this impossible time. That, that it was such an agony that his, 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 uh, his sweat turned into blood coming out of his pores. Into the very point in the agony and the brink of death. That's how much of a weight that he was carrying. And he still said, not my will, but your will. You see... Sometimes in our hard times, we want the easy way out. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We're looking for, is there a secret? Give me a book that tells me I don't have to go through this. But sometimes in impossible times, we got to go through it. Amen. Sometimes God says those famous words, suck it up. <laughs> Come on, just go through it. Roll up your sleeves. What was that? Yeah, beat a man. 
You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we just got to we just got to rise up and do what God wants us to do. Right. Sometimes we got to go as a lamb to the slaughter. What is this talking about? It's talking about being broken. Yes. Jesus allowed his life to be broken like this bread, to be torn, to be broken. I mean, so many times we see he, him being all God. He could have called all the legions of angels and wiped out humanity in seconds, <laughs> but he didn't. Because he was willing to be all submissive. He was willing to be broken before the Father. Amen. Are you with me here? Amen. He broke. He broke for you and I. And we realize in our lives is that as Jesus says, that not, not my will be done, but your will be done. We think about our lives. Are you willing to be broken? Sometimes we want it our way. We think we serve the God of Burger King. I'll have it my way. Amen. <laughs> You know, we serve the King of Kings, not Burger King. Amen. Right. Amen. And what happens sometimes, we say, you know, I want it my way. Can it be easier? This is the way I want it. This is the one man that I want in my life. This is the one lady I want in my life. I want this. I want that. And, and, we, and sometimes God says, no, i got to break you. i got to deal with you. I want, I want you to be used for my kingdom, but I can't use you the way you are. You've got to be broken. Amen. We need to ask ourselves, are we allowing our lives to be broken? Yeah. Broken like this bread. Broken before God. See, this is Christianity, folks. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not an easy life to turn through the two lips. Everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be right. You come to the Lord and, oh, it's all good. And I know some of you have said these words. It was a lot easier when I was in the world. It was a lot easier. I didn't have to go through this when I was in the world. Now I went forward and all of a sudden the devil's attacking me. Oh, the Bible says that the life of a transgressor is hard. Amen. It was hard in the world. It was hard to find the next fix. Amen. For the weekend. It was, it was hard to, to break in from one car into another to get my fix. You know, and then on top of that, you were so unsatisfied. Yep. That's right. It was harder in the world. Amen. It's, amen. it's a lot easier in God. He's my crutch. Can you say amen? amen? Can you look at something too and say, he, Jesus is my crutch. Yeah. Amen. He, I have no shame in that. And you know, this is, this is where God breaks us. He deals with us. Amen. amen. And, and we have to realize that he has a better plan for us. And as we allow our lives to be broken, also we see... That not only that, 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 that we realize that he's been broken for us, but are we willing to be broken for him? Amen. Yeah. To be broken for him. Amen. I can give you so many stories. As a young man serving God, I had to make some decisions in my life to be broken before God. I had to say, okay, can't go this way. I want to go this way, but God says, no, you're doing this. And God has to deal with you. Places where I've had to quit my job to be broken before God relationships I had to cease so God can break me. I remember the story of Catherine Coleman when she made the decision. She says, I remember the day that I died. On the corner when I was, to, when, when I was in, engaged to this man and I was going to go with that, I was going to go with that engagement and I was standing at the corner and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, am I going to go with this man and marry this man or am I going to go into the ministry? And there she allowed her life to be broken. She could have had a beautiful life, an easy life, married to a very well, well taken care of man who had taken care of her for years. But she chose ministry to be broken, to be single. Are you with me here? Sometimes we've got to allow God to break us. See, the Bible says that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. <laughs> then he broke it. You want to be blessed? <laughs> then you're going to be broken. Because to be blessed is to be broken. Yeah. Oh, bless me, Lord. Bless, but not that kind of blessing. <laughs> oh, bless me, Lord. But oh, he breaks us. You know why? Because when he, when he blessed us and he broke that bread, he was able to distribute it. Yeah. Yeah. He was able to distribute it to the masses. You see, you and I will never do anything great for God for not allowing our lives to be broken. You're going to be blessed, but God's going to break you. You, you show me somebody who's doing something for God, and I'll tell you they got stories of being broken. As a pastor, I know how it is to be broken. Pastor, we know. We, we got the bruises on our chest holding on to those sheep. Amen. We got, I can show you bite marks. I didn't know that sheep had teeth. Amen. Some of them had dentures and left those teeth on me. Amen. For years on end. Amen. You know what I'm telling you? I mean, you get hurt in the ministry. 
ministry. You get broken in the ministry. Sometimes you're going to be in church and I'm not going to prophesy. I'm going to just tell you how it is. You're going to get offended in church. Somebody's going to offend you. Somebody's going to say something stupid. Someone's going to misunderstand you. They're going to say something dumb. Oh, what are you going to do? Up and leave or are you going to allow God to break you? Amen. Amen. Are you going to allow God to do something in your life? Amen. Amen. Allowing our lives to be broken before God. This is so, so important because he blesses us. So that way, when he breaks us, he can actually truly use us yeah. Yeah. to be distributed. Jesus fed the 5,000. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 29, the Bible says in these words that for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body, broken for us. You see, there's a lot of people today that are sick in body because they don't discern that the Lord has been broken for us. They don't discern that the Lord has, has laid down his life and he was broken for us that you and I can be whole, that you and I can be healed. And that's why when we take communion, some of you say, well, I don't want I'm unworthy. You are worthy to take communion. Amen. You are worthy. When you say, oh, I need a healing God, you broke your body that I may be healed. How many have been healed by just partaking of communion? Amen. It's awesome what God does, yeah. showing Amen. us that he honors his word. He honors the brokenness of his body for you and I. Amen. Oh, God is so good. Amen. Broken. Somebody say broken. 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 I wonder if you would have be daring enough to pray, God, break me. Oh, I didn't get an amen there. <laughs> break me. Listen to me. You've been in the ministry long enough. You'll learn how to fall on the rock before it falls on you. Jesus, you don't got to tell me twice. Got it, Holy Spirit. Got it. Check. Got it. Amen. I'm in. I'm jumping on the rock. I'll deal with it. Amen. Rather than blame everybody else for everything that's going on. Lord God, it's me. I'm the man. It's my bad. Come on. Amen. Amen. Yep. Another thing we see, go to song. We're gonna go to uh, Songs of Solomon, the sexy book. <laughs> Songs of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 1. The Bible says it's not for teenagers to read, right? Now they're going to read it. Watch this. You want them to read the Bible? Just tell them don't read Song of Solomon. Chapter, uh, Song of Solomon is too sexy. It's, 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 it's uh, too sexy. Yeah, it's better than Twilight. <laughs> the Bible says here that I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley. And many people believe that in the book of Songs of Solomon, it's like Jesus talking to the bride. It's his relationship. If you want to know anything about intimacy, it's the love of the Father and, and God towards man and how he speaks to us. And, and there's so many beautiful analogies of life and, and, and intimate love of God for us as we read the book of Solomon. Because it's mushy, man. It's really mushy. And Rose of Sharon is, let me kind of break it down a little bit. Sharon is a city in Persia that was a place of much bloodshed. But Sharon means peace. It means peace. So here it is in our lives, uh, times of hardness, times of warfare, that because of Jesus, he brings peace. Times of chaos and time, things that are <laughs> upturned and, and, and the enemies attacking, attacking God can bring peace through Jesus Christ in our lives. Amen. Yeah. How many times did the apostles pray that the Lord Jesus Christ and the peace of God be upon you? He's talking about Sharon. He's talking about this beautiful peace in the time of warfare that we can call on. Another beautiful thing that we see uh, about, the, about the Rose of Sharon is just an amazing thing that, that it's a beautiful fragrance. The rose of Sharon, this beautiful fragrance, because of the peace of God in your life, because of the peace of God in my life, we bring the beauty and the fragrance of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Nobody rejects a rose, unless you're allergic to it. Amen. <laughs> nobody, nobody will. I mean, you give them a rose, it, it means love, it means, it means acceptance, it means peace. Amen. And as we see something here in the same sense that the Bible talks about, is that this, this beautiful rose, that, that Jesus being that beautiful rose, being torn and broken, but this beautiful fragrance in our lives. And in the spiritual realm, listen to me, you have a fragrance of victory. You have a yeah. fragrance of life in you because of Jesus Christ. Amen. This beautiful rose of Sharon, 
Now, this is not the Rose of Sharon, but there's a plant called the Rose of Sharon in Israel. And when all of, back in the 40s or back in the, yeah, in the 40s and 50s in Israel, many people left. I mean, they left, they left the ground and it was just desert land. There was nothing you can do with that desert land. But it was interesting about a Rose of Sharon. What they would do, they would plant that rose into the ground. They will plant that rose into the ground, and wherever they planted that plant, the rose of Sharon, it made the soil good and fertile for farming. Very interesting. Amen. See, this is Jesus. This is a beautiful type of Jesus, that he's the rose of Sharon in our lives. I mean, we're a wasteland before Jesus, amen. We have nothing to offer. Amen. There's nothing in our lives that we can offer to God. But because Jesus comes into our lives, comes into our hearts, he makes this ground good. Can you say amen? amen. amen. He, he right. makes our ground fertile. He makes you and I beautifully fertile and fruitful, and fruitful unto God, amen, because of him. That's, and you know what, not only that, because he's in our lives, <laughs> he's in our lives, he's in this church. Can you say amen? amen? You walk in here, there's a beautiful fragrance of the Holy Spirit. Is it coming from this corner? Is it coming? No. The Bible says it's not there, it's not there. No, the kingdom of God is within you. Amen. amen. The presence of God is in you. You amen. bring that presence of God. You manifest that presence amen. of God. Everywhere you go, listen to me, you make Walmart good. Come on, amen. amen. You make Target good. Hallelujah. Amen. You make Juno good. And Juno is blessed because you have the rose of Sharon yeah. in your life. Yeah. Amen. Everything around you becomes good. Yes. Hallelujah. Thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you. You're beautiful. In the spiritual realm, you're special. Come on now. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Lord. Also, the Bible says that I am the rose of Sharon. I am the lily of the valley. Yeah. The lily of the valley. Notice something that it's, it's almost two things here. A lily. First thing that pops up in the, when, after, the, after that long winter. That time when, when things are just, you know, dead. And is there any life again? That new beginning comes, comes spring. Comes the flowers. But you know where the first place is it comes up in? In the valley. Oh, we don't want to go to the valley. I like the mountaintop. Yeah. I like it being up in the mountaintop where things are really nice and you know, and I can see things, I can shout, I'm away from danger, but oh, there's some times we're in the valley. And in the valley is where the first the first proof of hope comes. It's where the lily pops up showing us there's a new beginning. There's a new hope. There's a new day. His compassions are new every morning. It's in the valley where we find our experiences with God. Amen. It's in the valley where we really get the breakthrough in our lives. I thank God for the mountaintops, but it's in the valleys where I felt the closest to God, where you're feeling in a time that maybe you've been terminal with a terminal sickness. Oh, you were close to God. A lot closer than you've ever been. And that sure is not a mountaintop. It's a valley. Amen. God is in the valley. God's in the mountaintop. But God is in the valley. And he shows us hope through the lily. I'm coming forth. I'm coming forth. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus is the lily of the valley. Amen. Hallelujah. Jesus humbled himself. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And as he humbled himself, the Bible says to us, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord because God gives grace to the humble, but he resists the proud. Yeah. Why does God resist the proud? Because you resist him. Yeah. Yeah. But the humble says, I'm here, God, whatever. I realize all that you've done for me. Don't take God and his sacrifice and his son as a spare tire for your life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So many have done that and have wasted their lives. He's broken for us. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the lily of the valley of our lives in the worst places of our lives. Now the Bible says this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, in Jesus being broken for us. 1 Peter 2, 24 says, Who himself bore our sins in his own body, his own body on a tree that we have, having died to sins, might live for righteousness by whose stripes you have been healed. He's healed us. 
by his broken body, by his blood. We don't need anything else. Your righteousness, you, you don't need to add to it. It's complete. It's called the finished work of the cross. Amen. What more can you add? It's already done. He's done everything that we that, that needs to be done, that we can have fellowship with him, that we can have a straight way of righteousness to heaven. What an awesome God that we serve. Yes. Amen. Amen. As my wife gets on the on, on the keys here, I want to just share, and closing up here, I want to talk about the blood. Because the blood means life. And I want to elaborate a little bit more on the blood. The blood is so important in our lives. Yes. Amen. And we know that the Bible brings out in these words, in John chapter 19, verse 34, 19, verse 34, it says, but one of the soldiers pierced his side when he was on the cross, pierced his side, and immediately blood and water came out. Jesus poured his blood for us. Why? Why his blood, God? Because it meant life. So let me say it again. Jesus poured his life for us. So we have the life of God. Amen. We have the healing. We have the fullness, as my wife was talking about last night. We have the fullness of God in our lives because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. The blood. The blood of Jesus. His blood washes us. His blood cleanses us. Yes. But don't take that as a an escape goat to sin. Don't take it as a permission slip. Because we know that His grace teaches us not to sin. Amen? Amen? And when we apply the blood of Jesus, we can apply the blood of Jesus in every shortcoming of our lives. In every journey of our lives, we can apply the power of the blood of Jesus. For we know that the scripture says that by the power of the blood they overcame. By the word of their testimony, amen, and the blood of the Lamb. Oh, and the fount of the blood of the Lamb will never run dry. You cannot bear it out. It's the blood throughout eternity that we will claim that our victory for what he has done, the blood. Amen. And the devil hates the blood. Why? Because it is the very life of the King of Kings. Amen. The authority is your spiritual badge. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22. And according to the law, Almost all things are purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That's just the way it is. Oh, is God some bloodthirsty God? No. Again, his life. It was purified with his life. His life purified my life. His life purified your life. His blood is good enough. Amen? Amen. His blood. You might be sitting here today and thinking, oh, I've done this, I've done that. No way, God. Oh, man, God can forgive. His blood is enough. His blood is enough. It wasn't the great cover-up, but it was to empower you and I. And I thank God that when he bought us, he didn't buy us with gold or silver, as Peter says or with traditions. But he, he bought us with his blood. Thank you, Father. Amen. His awesome blood that was spilled for us. His awesome blood that was given freely for us. Without measure. Yes. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. We thank you for your blood being poured for us freely. Yes. Given freely. Your body being broken. Oh, we thank you. For the crown of thorns, we thank you.